One of the things I love about this this platform is being able to talk to leaders like yourself and and hear some of your personal insights as to you know what makes a good leader, but also you know how you how you go to work um, in in a potentially dangerous uh, occupation. Um, I think it's fascinating. Uh, so in that context, tell me a little bit about some of the things that you have done. And um, in my mind right now, I have a visual of a movie um, and I'm trying to think of the movie. I think, I think did it, it win any Oscars. It did, it did, exactly. Is it The Hurt Locker? That's the movie, yeah. thank you. So The Hurt Locker. So I always ask this because when I talk with somebody who's been there and done that, I'd love to get their insight as to when you see something on the movie, it's like, okay, where did they get it wrong? Or, or, you know, how accurate is it? So that's kind of more like just something I, I would love to know as, as a nice to know, but, um, but I would love to hear some of the things that you have done both on land and underwater that have, that, that are um, memorable events in your career thus far. So, sorry, I wanted to just uh, jump back to uh, the capabilities of Fleet Avenue Pacific, which you had touched on before, to, to answer your question about how how does the Hurt Locker in Hollywood, you know, align with the reality of doing the job. Awesome. So, so Fleet Avenue Pacific is also responsible not only for maritime ordinance, such as sea mines, okay. but they also have a responsibility for land-based ordinance as well. So that'd be anything from grenades to cruise missiles to 2,000 pound bombs. Uh, that's called conventional munitions disposal. So those are designed by to a certain standard by a recognized factory or or, or nation. Sure. Uh, you also have improvised explosive devices, which are IEDs. It's a commonly used or at least a, a more commonly known acronym, especially since the the Afghanistan war. Right. And improvised explosive devices are, as the name suggests, they are fabricated in a makeshift capacity mm -hmm. using bits and pieces to achieve you know an explosive an explosive effect. Right. So we also, at Fleet Avenue Pacific, have a counter IED capability. Okay. So we have operators who are trained to deal with not only the conventional, but also the improvised. Uh, so with a movie like The Hurt Locker, what I'll say, so I've trained as an IED operator in the United Kingdom. Okay. I did a five-year exchange there. It was supremely beneficial. But one of the great benefits is that you get the UK IED experience. Right. Sorry, IEDD. Right. Improvised Explosive Device Disposal Experience. Awesome. And the, uh, the United Kingdom are world leaders in this field. So I was a, a very fortunate beneficiary of that. So what I'll say about the Hurt Locker is, this is not a job where one person goes around and does things. This right. is not a job where they run down the road with a pair of snips and start cutting things. <laughs> you know, often you use remote devices, you use robots to achieve as much as you can because ultimately it's about keeping the area safe, but also keeping yourself safe so that you can go on to do further jobs. Right. The right. last thing you want to do is go down to an explosive threat that you haven't adequately tried to resolve using a robot. So uh, in, in the Hurt Locker movie, you see often he's running around doing the business. That's not how I would suggest it truly happens. It's Hollywood. It's Hollywood. But yeah. what I will say is it does paint a good story right. to, uh, to a, a, uh, to a uh, it paints a good story for an audience. Right. Um, yes. It paints, you know, the, the cool, interesting, you know, high profile things, yep. but like anything else, it's, it's the highlights. It's like you do this as one small part of the job under very specific circumstances. It's not all the time. Right. At all. Right, 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 right. Uh, very fair. And, and you mentioned about being in an exchange or going on exchange to the, uh, to England, um, the, the United Kingdom. I'd love to hear a little bit about that experience. How, how do you, do, how do you differentiate what you have learned here in Canada versus what you were taught in your experiences in the United Kingdom? Uh, so Canada, the United States, and the United Kingdom have very similar explosive ordnance disposal philosophies. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all, I wouldn't say they're interchangeable, but they're very close to being interchangeable. So we commonly work with our partners 
to ensure we have that interoperability. So it's not, I would suggest it's not very different, but I would suggest that especially with, in terms of improvised explosive device disposal capability, the United Kingdom, because they had uh, some conflict with the Republic of Ireland for quite a long time, right. that's where many IED philosophies and principles originate from. Ah, okay. Uh, and the British uh, remain quite active in the world today. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also have a lot of conventional uh, conventional call-outs on the UK mainland because it was bombed extensively during the Second World War and actually the First World War as well. Right. And they've been stockpiling munitions for various various wars yeah. for quite a long time. Sure. So whereas in Canada, if we dive into the Pacific, we get about 85 calls a year to deal with you know, yeah. such as this. Mm -hmm. In the United Kingdom, it's about 300 a year. Wow. And Almost so one, have, one a day? One a day. So every, every 18 hours, actually, there is a, a Royal Navy... EOD team, explosive ordnance disposal, on the road dealing with a conventional color. And they also have larger, they tend to have larger munitions found sure. yeah. than, uh, than they do in Canada because they were bombed. Yeah. They were bombed by, right. uh, by Nazi Germany. Right, right. All right, Jody, so we've made our way up to the Maritime Explosive Ordnance Disposal Department of Fleet Diving Unit Pacific, otherwise known as the bomb team. So uh, we're just going to head over here into uh, into our building. We'll show you a few tools of the trade. Awesome. Follow me. Thank you. So Fleet Diving Unit Pacific uh, offers two different explosive neutralization capabilities. The first is called conventional munitions disposal. That is the factory made to a standard items that are produced by militaries or for militaries for use in conflict. Uh, we also have uh, a counter IED, improvised explosive device capability, which is to deal with the makeshift explosive threats that we may encounter, particularly when deployed in active theaters. So I'll just bring you a little bit closer here. So many of the tools uh, on display here are meant for counter IED. Uh, the crux of counter IED, one of the guiding principles, is to never put yourself in a situation where a robot can do it better. So typically speaking, we employ what we call remote means or remote devices, robots to, uh, to accomplish the objective that we're seeking to, uh, to have accomplished. Uh, so this is one of our smaller robots. It's called the Allen Vanguard, but really that's just the name of the company. Uh, it's a small robot, uh, slightly less capable than the larger one, but it can be carried uh, by one person. Uh, it can be deployed actively uh, on, a dis sorry, on a dismounted team in the theater. And uh, it's also useful for small spaces such as on airlines. Uh, this is able to fit through the hallway or sort of the passageway of an airline. Awesome. So, number of different tools to accomplish the job, but the principle is the same. The principle is to keep people safe and keep our operators um, as safe as possible and to have them do as little, what we would call downrange, down the road, on site mm -hmm. as possible. Awesome. So over here, this is a extremely useful piece of kit. Often overlooked is an x-ray. If you want to know what you're looking at, the best thing to do is x-ray and see inside of it. Right. So this can be carried by hand, but it can also be mounted on a robot. Uh, to take to your objective area to x-ray remotely. That gives our operators a better understanding of what they're facing, so they're not going down the road uh, without the proper information. Right. Uh, these are just some examples of items we may come across uh, as a part of our duties for conventional explosives. So this is a conventional anti-tank mine, a uh, conventional rocket, and a uh, conventional solid shot projectile. So over here we have the bomb suit. So uh, contrary to uh, the perception that may be in the public, this is not worn all the time for all reasons. So commonly you'll want to send a robot down the road in order to achieve as much as you can. And only then, once you've done everything you can to make the area safe for yourself and for others, would you don the bomb suit, go down the road and do what you need to do to accomplish your task. Uh, it's not commonly worn for conventional munitions disposal, uh, but it's very often worn in the improvised explosive device sorry, in the counter IED, as a counter IED piece. Right. So these here, these are called disruptors. So this is your primary tool to uh, attack uh, an improvised explosive device. What it effectively is, is it's a water gun. So it's a large, it's a stainless steel tube that you fill with water and behind it you put, uh, we call it a shotgun cartridge, but uh, a cartridge that compresses that water once fired uh, and then projects that stream of concentrated water at a device uh, with the intent to scramble or disrupt the electronic components before they have an, you know, the ability to complete their circuits and then fire the device. Interesting. Cool. So bigger ones, 
for bigger devices, smaller ones for more precise, uh, more precise shots. Right. Uh, these are just mock-ups of uh, improvised explosive devices. So this is a, a good example. Uh, so we called it if we called this a letter bomb, what you might do, you might have a disruptor upon a robot, which you can then send down the road to target this particular device. Instead of having one of our operators approach on foot, something they're, un they're not sure about, mm -hmm. uh, instead you employ a robot to accomplish the same things. And uh, this is our large scale uh, robot. Uh, it's called the TO EVO. And this is uh, the backbone of counter IED work. Uh, this is what you want to use to accomplish as much of your job as you can before you yourself would go uh, investigate downrange. I guess the only other thing I'll add is that uh, Fleet Diving Union Pacific responds to 85 colors a year. Uh, not many of them are IED colors, most of them are conventional colors for things ranging from uh, projectiles, uh, mortars, grenades, uh, and occasionally larger ordnance. But uh, in the Vancouver area, so around the lower mainland, it's, uh, it used to be used as a training area, certain areas such as in Vernon or around Chilliwack, so that's where you know, with the military handing land back to the public and making sure it's clear, occasionally uh, when builders come in, they'll dig up an area where uh, they'll find ordnance they didn't expect. Right. Uh, so that's a very typical call out for our people here in the Pacific. Interesting. Uh, in addition to, uh, as I described before, you know, the artifacts from the Second World War that uh, veterans may have taken home with them, and then once they pass away, they're typically found by their families upon cleanup. Right. Right. Very cool. Um, and in terms of like uh, geography that you guys cover, um, how far how far out do you go uh, when a uh, when a device is found? So uh, we are responsible for land ordinance uh, on Vancouver Island up to Nanaimo. Okay. Uh, past Nanaimo, it's the responsibility of uh, CFB Comox. They have an Air Force bomb disposal team there. Okay. On the mainland, we're responsible up to Prince George, uh, and then we are responsible eastward out to the Alberta border. Wow. But for underwater ordnance, so that is devices found in the water, yep. we're responsible all the way out to Thunder Bay. Wow, holy smokes. So a good portion of Canada. A good portion of Canada. Although, to be fair, in terms of underwater ordnance uh, throughout Canada, if they're in areas that are very remote where it's unlikely to be disturbed, oftentimes we note it, we make a log of it, but, uh, sorry, we make a log of it, but uh, we won't necessarily dispatch a team because the threat to the public is extremely low. Right. Uh, we'll just mark the area, make sure everyone knows where it is, but often we're not called upon to, to deal with it if it's exceptionally remote and underwater. Right, right. And for the, for the robot that's behind you, um, how long does it take to get up to speed to, to properly operate a piece of equipment like that? So we, uh, we undertake a great deal of training. Uh, as part of the, uh, the clearance diver trade. So the first course you'll do is uh, your conventional basic uh, explosives course, about six weeks long, conducted at CFD Gagetown. And uh, this will enable you to identify ordnance through generics. So you can generically tell what it is, but it doesn't allow you to conduct what we would call a render safe procedure. So you'll be able to look at something, determine if it is safe to move or not safe to move. And then if it is uh, not safe to move, you can only blow it up on site or destroy it by controlled demolition. So that's your basic understanding package. So next, you'll do an eight month course in the United States of America uh, at Eglin Air Force Base. So this is the Advanced Conventional Mediation Disposal Course, which covers everything from grenades to cruise missiles. Uh, there's a small phase on improvised explosive devices and then the underwater ordinance as well. Uh, that takes eight months. Uh, and then when members come back, they're qualified to conduct, again, those render safe procedures. So now instead of only being able to pick up or destroy on site, you have the option to investigate closely and uh, come up with a plan to safely prosecute a device um, in the hopes that you can render it then safe to move or safer to move out of the area. Interesting. And uh, one of the things I haven't asked you yet is how many people are are specialists in your trade? Like, because this is specialized training, so I'm curious to know in the Navy and specifically Fleet Dive Unit Pacific, where where you are the executive officer. How many people in this in this unit? So in the unit itself, in itself, there's 108 personnel. Okay. Uh, there's about 56 clearance divers, and in total in Canada, there's about 135 clearance divers spread out between the West Coast uh, CFB Shearwater in Halifax, uh, and also at the Experimental Diving Group in Toronto. So 135 overall in the unit here out of 108, we're approximately half the number, and the other people, so the other members who make up the the staff are logisticians, uh, supply techs, 
engineers are a large component and also reservist port inspection divers who often supplement our diving teams. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, so great kind of elite, uh, very small, close-knit unit. It's certainly a, a tight-knit, small unit. I think that's one of the greatest benefits to working at Fleet Diving Unit Pacific or, or any clearance diving unit is it's small, it's an intimate organization, you work in small teams, and uh, you have the opportunity to fly around the world to, to do your job on behalf of the Royal Canadian Navy in that small team, which I don't believe you'll get uh, on a larger ship. The best thing about being on a large ship is you have the big core crew, mm -hmm. but working with a small team, uh, the close, intimate, partnerships that you uh, established are, uh, are tough to beat. It's, uh, it's really nice to come to work every day with a group of people who are enthusiastic and motivated and happy to be here. And that's what I find because the training is so difficult, the pipeline is so difficult to become a parent driver. Uh, that's what you will receive on the opposite end, those types of motivated people. Right on, right on. Thank you very much, Lieutenant. Pleasure. So this is one of the vehicles we may elect to deploy uh, when we're called upon to neutralize an explosive threat. Uh, it's equipped to deal with both conventional and improvised call-outs. Uh, predominantly though, this is a vehicle we would deploy to an improvised call-out. So on board it has uh, both styles of bomb disposal robot, which you've seen earlier. Uh, it will have all of the different disruptors and disruptor cartridges to neutralize a wide range of packages. Uh, but it will also carry the conventional explosives required to deal with conventional type threats. So those are the grenades, the projectiles, the solid shot projectiles that we also demonstrated earlier. Uh, it can carry up to five personnel, though we typically deploy in teams of two. Uh, and it has additional, additional features such as uh, it has a high-masted camera so we can perform long-range reconnaissance of an area that's out in the open and get that better intelligence as to what we're facing at a further distance. Again, one of the main principles of improvised explosive device disposal keeping the operator as safe as possible and doing everything as remote as you can. Awesome. Awesome. Let's go take a look around and... So here you see uh, an example of our larger robot, uh, which has approached uh, a suspicious package. So again, uh, this is uh, typically what you'll want to deploy first. Uh, in order to deal with what you have done wrong. Not only does it have a number of camera systems to give you a better on-site picture of what you're facing, it also carries tools to, uh, to commence, a new, commence a neutralization uh, of your suspect package down there. Uh, this will be the smaller of the two robots. Again, very useful for smaller, more confined quarters because it's not always appropriate or available. Uh, the space you would need to deploy the larger variant, both of which are, uh, are carried on board the bomb truck here. And uh, the bottom line is we wish to provide our operators all the tools they can use in order to safely neutralize explosive threats. So the more tools we can provide them, the safer they will be. That's awesome. And how long does it take to, to get up to speed to operate one of these robots? Uh, so in terms of training, uh, we discussed before, it's a six week conventional basic munitions course. It is a seven to eight month advanced conventional munitions course. Uh, down at Eglin Air Force Base in the United States. And then in terms of improvised device disposal, uh, it's another four week uh, operator assist course. So that's where you learn to drive the weapons, you understand the different disruptors. Uh, essentially you are uh, the subject matter expert in the tools themselves. And then the number one operators course where you lead an improvised explosive device call out uh, is three months in duration. Awesome. And the, the way that you would approach a a suspect device like we're looking at right now is with robot but it's got multiple cameras and then describe to me what is at the end of that arm so just uh you're thinking about this right here yep uh so this is a disruptor uh so essentially what it is is it's uh it's it's a water gun um so it's a stainless steel tube or titanium tube that has a, a quantity of water in it backed up by its shotgun cartridge so when you manipulate it into position, uh, that cartridge just fires, it compresses the water uh, into a high energy dense uh, burst of water that will hit an electronic package with the intent to disrupt and separate the electronic components uh, before they have an, a chance to connect their circuits and fire electronically. Uh, this is the preferred means of dealing with almost any type of electrically initiated improvised explosive. So we won't always uh, deploy either robots or people uh, to deal with an improvised explosive device call-out because sometimes those are uh, 
they turn out to be hoaxes or they turn out to be mistakes. So a prime example might be a gym bag left behind uh, by a military gym. If uh, we didn't understand where that bag came from, we might be called to investigate, but that could turn out to be not a device. So you may not need to employ a robot or even a person to deal with it if you ask the right number of questions to determine what you're actually dealing with. Right. And as you as you showed a little bit earlier, you also have x-rays. So you can deploy those to take a look at. You might not need to pull out the robot and have them do what they're doing. No, absolutely. Um, although we have the option of neutralization, you're absolutely correct. We can employ x-rays to see what's inside uh, a suspicious package left behind or a suspicious box. And that may tell us what's inside without resorting to the use of something with more uh, more effect. Awesome. Lieutenant, thank you so much for sharing uh, for sharing a little bit about the bomb disposal unit with the Royal Canadian Navy. Our pleasure. Um, so out of curiosity, did you, during your time there, did you have the opportunity to, to go and, um, and um, render safe any ordinance? So uh, when I was in the United Kingdom, uh, they have a term called the number one operator. So the number one operator is the operator in charge of a, a bomb disposal team. Uh, that handles both conventional and improvised calls. So I did about 75 of them as a number one operator, which is really the crux of why Canada sends clearance diving officers to the UK, because they gain the experience in the UK that we wouldn't likely encounter here, because we just don't have the same frequency of calls. So, sure. Uh, there's a Royal Navy EOD team on the road every 18 hours in the United Kingdom. They do about 300 calls a year, wow. whereas our unit, Fleet Diving Union Pacific, does about 85. Okay. So, so there's much more ordnance yep. throughout the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, I responded to four improvised explosive device calls, uh, one of which uh, had 10 small fire-based improvised devices. And uh, that one there was probably the most I have ever done my job. And uh, that's where you are in a position where you are being asked to make this scene safe. And uh, typically improvised devices are a little bit I would say they're a little bit more dangerous than conventional devices because they're they're manufactured in that makeshift way. Right. Whereby you're unsure of how exactly they function, so you have to ask the right questions and build yourself, you know, a picture right. of what it is you're walking into. Yeah. Whereas with conventional devices, you know, they're they've typically been seen before and you can typically identify them by eye. Right. Generically. Right. Um, yeah. The one the one call with the ten incendiary IEDs was probably the highlight of my exchange. That was. How long did that take you, Kevin, to to kind of go through that and 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 render that scene safe? Uh, it took about eight hours. Wow. So we got the call at about two p.m. Okay. And we were there until ten p.m. Wow. And a large part of that is not only initially arriving, asking the questions, and determining you know, what it is you're facing before taking the appropriate action. Yeah. Uh, it's also there's a great deal of forensics involved because there's a criminal element to to call such as that. So right. you want to make sure that you are exercising forensic responsibility, yeah. ensuring that the scene is safe, then ensuring you collect the required forensics so that the the proper authorities can prosecute a criminal yeah. uh, proceeding. Right. Interesting. Um, tell me now about Fleet Dive Unit Pacific specifically. How big is this formation? and where where do you see the unit going forward in terms of like modern modern approaches to the job that you guys do? So the way Fleet Diving Unit Pacific, I believe, uh, is trending towards is more and more remote work. Hmm. There is a term; it's uh, taking the member out of the minefield. Ah, uh, okay. But the the idea behind that concept is the more and more we do remotely, the more it is safe to do. So working back to that. How does, how does the hurt locker differ from reality? Doing things with remote drones, robots, anything like that to keep our members out of harm's way, mm -hmm. that I believe is the direction that Fleet Diving Union Pacific and Explosive Ordnance Disposal are trending. Right. So what, again, one of the jobs of the diving unit is to clear sea mines. Right. One of the options you have for clearing sea mines once they're found is to put a diver in the water with an explosive charge to uh, place upon that ordinance. Mm -hmm. And then to return safely ashore, or sorry, safely back uh, to their diving boat, mm -hmm. transit some area away, and then conduct an explosion, right? A controlled explosion. But there are other means out there. 
remote disposal means where they're effectively small torpedoes with cameras right. uh, that you can remote control directly into a mine. They're disposable, they're uh, one-time use, but you save all the trouble of putting a human being in harm's way. Right. So I believe there will always be a place though for diving mm -hmm. because there are areas of the world, uh, areas of the maritime environment that robots will not be able to penetrate. So in the surf zone, for example, from zero to three meters, it's very difficult to put any robot in there with any degree of accuracy. Right. And that's still an area that we would be required to keep, or sorry, to, to assure that it was safe. Right. So there, I believe there'll always be a place for diving. Right. The divers will always be an option. Yeah. Uh, but I do believe the future is trying to work towards remote and drones. Interesting. So, uh, Kevin, thank you so much for this this chat. Um, I love hearing what you guys do, and I think our next step is to go and actually see some examples. Of that is how you a guys fantastic do. idea, Jody. I can honestly say that my desk is. My office is not that exciting. It's really the uh, the members who do all the really exciting stuff now. So I think it'd be a great idea to go see them. Awesome. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sailor First Class Michael Rocco from Hamilton, Ontario. I've been a member of uh, Fleet Diving Unit Pacific as a clearance diver for the past five years, and I've spent pretty much that entire time up here in the uh, Explosive Ordnance Disposal Department, which is just a fancy way for us to say uh, the bomb squad here in Esquimalt. So uh, during the work hours, eight to four usually, we're responsible for responding to any, any calls regarding explosives on the island or on the, on the mainland as well if, uh, if we have to. And these are just some of the items that we've picked up over the past uh, two, three years. If we start there right here, this was actually, may, I can't remember exactly, this may have been my first ever call. It's just an old World War I uh, potato masher hand grenade. And I uh, picked it up down on Esquimalt Road. Uh, it was my first call, it was pretty green at the time, great experience, we liaised with the police Pretty much for every call but it was just uh, just fantastic to actually get out there and do your job and uh, I guess an important piece to say is everything you see here is is inert it's all practice it's all safe anytime we do have a uh, respond to a call where there is anything potentially dangerous or any sort of explosives or anything we think may not be safe we dispose of it right away in, uh, in a very safe manner so we only bring back things that are that are interesting to us and that we can use for further training so another example is just a 3.5 inch anti-tank round or just you know for just another another fancy name for a rocket propelled grenade, right? RPG rocket launcher kind of thing. It's just uh, looks exactly like the real thing, but uh, we can tell just on stamping and through our training that it's just a practice inner round. And so we use this all the time for training the new guys or just enhancing our skills. Uh, another round we have here, just a 40 millimeter solid steel shot, similar to these two rounds here. Just solid metal, just shot from a cannon. For training, no explosives in it. But uh, these are things that we like to have around here. We practice metal detecting, we practice searching, we practice just responding to calls. So that way, uh, when the real thing does come, we're, we're completely prepared for it. Uh, a few more things here. Again, practice, just a couple of mortars, some bigger ones, some smaller ones. And uh, ones we see a lot are just these little hand grenades, Mark 36 is American grenades. They're everywhere. Uh, you wouldn't think it, I didn't think it until I got in the trade, but uh, now that I've been here for a couple of years, I picked up probably 15 or 20 of these in the last couple of years. And, uh, it's, it's a great job, we enjoy doing it, and uh, you're constantly learning. It's important to bring these training pieces back so that we can better educate ourselves and then uh, the public with uh, the situations like this. Awesome. Uh, and Mike, if you don't mind, uh, tell me about that split round. Split round here. So this is uh, just a four inch solid shot projectile here. Uh, imagine just a bigger version of this essentially. We picked it up, our, uh, one of our EOD guys determined it was safe, so we, we brought it back and then on one of our range days, we, uh, we were practicing with some cutting charges and we determined, we decided like, why not try to cut this thing in half? Solid steel, very difficult to do, but uh, the guys that did it, very good at their job and they were able to cut it directly in half. I don't know if you can see right there, just perfectly in half. Can't find the other piece. It must, uh, must be rotting away somewhere, but just a very cool thing we do. And it's one of our ways that we, uh, we can dispose of around it if we have to in a safe manner. But uh, like I said, we bring it back for training and that's what we did. Awesome. Uh, tell me w one of your most memorable uh, responses, if you don't mind. Uh, okay, sure. So it's probably going to be this one again, this this old World War One like German hand grenade. It was one of my first calls just down on the Squimalt Road. We received a call from the uh, the RCMP or from, from our jock that uh, they found this or this was discovered in the house after they were called. Uh, so I guess the backstory was someone was on parole, their parole officer came to do a surprise inspection and during the inspection they noticed what looked like a, you know, an old hand grenade or something that probably shouldn't have been in someone's, someone's uh, living room. So we went in there with the cops, they pointed it out. We weren't sure at first if it was a, if it was a live round or if it was practice, so we had to take all the precautions to ensure that it was safe and then uh, 
through our investigation, we determined it was safe. So we, we packed it up, we got out of there, but then we also helped the RCMP kind of go through the house a little bit too, to make sure there wasn't anything else there. Cause it was a little, was a little sketchy of an area. So we had to do our best to make sure that uh, when we're leaving that scene, it's, it's safe for everybody. Very interesting. And, um, how, how much training does it take to get up to speed where you can deploy on um, on call outs like that? So um, we can we can deploy immediately after our uh, conventional munitions disposal course, which is just a quick two three month course in Gage Town. Mm-hmm. But we can't act as like the uh, the person in charge of the call. You're there as a, as an assistant. For, for instance, but after we do uh, we do a, a seven month course in Florida, mm-hmm. and after that seventh month course, we're awarded the uh, like uh, I guess the authority to go out as the lead on the call, and then we're the ones that actually make like discern if an uh, if a piece of ordinance is is safe, if it's unsafe, if it's live, if if it's practiced. So after you're done that course, you've been in the trade for probably two three years, so it's probably a good safe to say about two three years of your of your career before you can actually get out there and, and lead a call awesome awesome and you also dive as part of your trade is that correct yes. uh do you have a, a a side that you are more inclined to like the dive side or the land side of of the job that you guys do in terms of explosive ordnance disposal question. so personally for me when i when i got into this trade i was uh i wasn't aware of the actual scope of what what it encompassed mm-hmm. i thought clearance diver just as a name i thought it was predominantly diving right but since i've been in the trade now for five years i've been solely in the like the bomb section so i've i actually haven't dove very much in my career i've been strictly on land which which i love but uh, there is a big dive element that we do it's just it's just not very prevalent in this department sure sure no fair enough uh thank you very much mike it's been a pleasure thanks thank you